all of our club members. This month, I'm bringing you a topic that's close to my heart, and it's the idea of legacy. It's the idea of family. When I first took off to Champagne in 2005, you know, what I was familiar with with Champagne Houses were these big brands. And I think sometimes we think about champagnes as brands. You know, we know Veuve Clicquot being one of the most recognized brands in the world and Pomery and Tattinger and Moom, but actually there's people behind these brands and we often forget this. And I started my career working for the big houses, but what I realized when I got to Champagne is that there's all these small families toiling away behind the scenes and learning their craft and passing their wealth, their wisdom, their winemaking skills from one generation to the other. And that's what really captured my heart about Champagne. And when I left working for LVMH, working for those big brands and went back in 2008 to, to retrain to be independent in Champagne, I was lucky enough for the Champagne Society to say, well, okay, now that you're gonna be independent, let's align you with some big houses, some medium houses and some smaller producers to give you the full picture of what we think Champagne is. And they chose some smaller producers that I'd never heard of before and organized for me to spend time in the vineyard with all of them. And this month, we're gonna focus on the idea of legacy. We're gonna focus on the idea of passing the baton from one generation to the other. And I've chosen two families that strike most powerfully in my mind from this experience in 2008, two winemaking families that I saw on the same day. We are looking at Champagne de Souza, we are looking at Champagne Geoffroy, and how they have successfully passed the baton down from generation to generation. So the first family that started in Champagne was actually the family of Runa, officially in 1729. Before that, we had Dom Perignon, who was crafting the idea of this bubbling wine, the secondary fermentation in the bottle. But really, a lot of opportunity came after crisis. You know, where there is something tragic that happens, there is often a rise. And we had World War I and World War II that really did affect the Champagne region. And a lot of families just couldn't continue after World War I. And this was also true uh, of the families that sold the vineyards to the D'Souza family. So the D'Souza family, as you would well know, not a very French name, it is actually a Portuguese family. Manuel D'Souza, the paternal great grandfather of the Maison came over following the tragedy of World War I when everyone was in depression, when champagne sales were very low and was very astute in buying some of the best Grand Cru sites for Chardonnay in all of the Champagne region. It's impossible to replicate this kind of purchase today. Where the house is located in a Vise, a Grand Cru region, the purest of chalk, beautiful quality soils. They also have parcels in Cramont, in Auger, in Le Manil sur Auger. So some of the most um, incredible parcels in the Côte de Blanc, perfect for growing uh, very precise Chardonnay grapes. And this is what the family excel in. So Manuel started the Maison in the 1920s. Unfortunately, he passed away in 1929, he was gassed. Um, in the chambers in, in 1929. This is a tough region. This is a tough period of our history. Um, his wife succeeded him with her four children. Uh, and then Charlotte and Valentin and Julie, the current heirs of the household, their father, Eric, it was his father who took over the business. And on his passing, Eric took the reins of the house. And look, Eric was the gentleman that I met in 2008. And I remember sitting with him and him being so incredibly passionate. His philosophies around biodynamics and organics were so ahead of their time. And I think I really got a sense of terroir. I really got a sense of the importance of the purity of chalk when I met with Eric. And him describing the attributes of how he makes wine. The D'Souza family use old vines, so we're talking 50 years plus. The importance of their terroir being 100% chalk and, and really the deep root of the vine in the chalk is so very important for the quality of the vines and the expression of minerality and saltiness, which is evident in all of the cuvées, even the young cuvées of the Maison. This is a family that have come from Portugal, have come from somewhere completely different and really turned their hand to crafting champagne. I don't know of any other Portuguese family in the region, there may be, but it's a brave move to uproot your family and come to the champagne region to produce 
One of the most difficult wines on the planet to produce in one of the most cl climatically challenging regions, but they, done, they did that with a plum. Um, we are very sad to report, and this is part of why we're focusing this topic on legacy, uh, that Eric did pass away a couple of weeks ago and we pay our respects to the family. I've known Eric for quite some time. I've known the children for quite some time. We've had a long relationship with D'Souza. Um, but now the baton has been passed to the fourth generation and we have the very young Charlotte, Valentin and Julie who are proudly stepping up into dad's shoes and have taken over the reins of the business. And the champagne that's coming out to all of our champagne lovers this month, and what a great choice, it is D'Souza Avec Le Temps. And I've chosen this wine because it really is something that the children have been working on. It's something that they have been crafting. It's new to the range. It is a Blanc de Blanc, so 100% Chardonnay, which is very much hallmark of the D'Souza family. They are Chardonnay specialists, and I love their Blanc de Blancs. It's called a Vecle Tempe, and if you translate from French to English, it means with time. And the reference to time is that the vineyards that they're using in this particular cuvee are under transition from being certified biodynamic and organic, whereas all the other parcels of the vineyard have been certified biodynamic and organic for quite some time. Now, we have 100% Chardonnay, all Grand Cru. Grand Cru are parcels, Cru meaning a village, that rank 100 on the ranking system. So the very best plots in Champagne. We have four of them. We have Avis, which is where the house is located. We have Auge, we have Le Manil sur Auge, very famous, and Cremant. Some sensational fruit coming through. Now the vines, we've got the house that averages 45 years of age. We've got some old vine, we've got some younger vine, but we are getting the depth of the root system. Anywhere from 10 to 12 meters below surface, the family believes that the deeper the roots, the more minerals and more saltiness that the root can extract from the terroir, from the chalk. And that translates into this chalky minerality. I have to say that I don't think that there's a pure expression of this chalky minerality in any other house. It's so hard to define minerality, but really when you put yourself in front of this glass and put your nose over it and put it on your palate, you see that chalky minerality. It's like licking a stone. We have a funny story of a group of clients that came to Champagne with me quite some time ago trying to identify this minerality and some of them did actually lick chalk and it's, it's been an ongoing joke but that's a great way of assessing and describing minerality. We've got a very brief aging time frame on this wine so it's, it's drunk fresh, um, it's just on two years in the cellar but it's amazing how much complexity, how much breadth, how much silkiness you have on the palate for a wine that is so young. We've got wines that are aging in barrique. We've got a very careful handling. I was there for bottling a couple of years ago. The classical music is playing to soothe the wine as it goes from vat into the bottle. We've got quartz in the vineyard. We've got a small team, a young team who are bottling the wine. Everything done meticulously, everything done by hand. You have a chalky finesse and minerality, but this beautiful, lovely lemon curd and almond and cream on the nose. And it's not tart. It's not tart, it is beautifully soft and silky on the palate. Um, a white fleshy fish would do beautifully with this particular champagne, but something that is regularly in my fridge, something that's regularly in my glass, and I think that everybody who's receiving this wine this month will see that the wines are of astonishing quality across the range. The second coupe that's coming out to all of our connoisseurs in the club this month is a champagne that I love dearly. It's a house that I love dearly. It's Geoffroy. It's the uh, champagne expression. I met René Geoffroy in 2008 on the same day that I met Eric D'Souza. So two incredibly passionate producers, two men that have really um, held a memory in my mind from all of that time. Both of them very different, both of them specialising in different terroirs, not wildly dissimilar in their production techniques, but both of them working with different regions. So we have D'Souza located in the Côte de Blanc, the Coast of White, featuring Chardonnay. We have the house of Geoffroy located in Ailly. Now, previously the house was in Cumières in the Vallée de la Manne, so a region that's commonly known for Pinot Meunier. New production facility when I met René. And 
this house has always stayed fond in my mind. And again, we have multiple generations passing the baton from one to the other. So in the 1950s, we had Roger Geoffroy and his wife, Julienne, who founded the house. They then passed the baton down to René. René then passed the baton down to Jean-Baptiste. And Jean-Baptiste, who is the current heir of the Maison, still quite young and still an amazing winemaker, but of course we must train the next generation to come up in our footsteps. You've got so much knowledge, you've got so much know-how, and to think about um, a champagne that ages for such a long period of time, to see how a wine evolves, to see how the grapes within certain plots of your vineyard evolve. I mean, we've got 14 hectares of grapes here. We've got quite a few different parcels, everything vinified separately, everything tightly monitored, pressed and produced. The Maison uses the traditional cockard press so that they can do their pressing in small batches to really identify different terroirs to give Jean-Baptiste and his father and now his girls um, a real palette of wines for, for blending. And what we have at the moment is the transition from Jean-Baptiste to the five daughters. We have, he, we have Margot, we have Sasha, we have Rosalie, um, Azalea, and we have Columbine. I hope I got the, the pronunciation of the girls' names right. They're all incredibly beautiful, stepping up into dad's footsteps and learning the craft of winemaking, which is not easy in the Champagne region. You need to know how to work with the weather. The times are changing. We've got global change and also understand your vineyard plots. It is very traditional for you to take over in father's footstep or mother's footstep. And you know, some of the kids are moving off into other careers, but will always be drawn back into the family business at some point, even with a broader mindset. If you've gone off and done an arts degree or a law degree or winemaking in Australia, as is often the case. So we have the beautiful house of Jeffwa coming to all of our connoisseurs this month, a house that's located in Ayi. You might be familiar with that town. It was originally the capital of Champagne, really, um, the heart of Champagne and, and home to some other famous houses like Boulanger. The Champagne that's coming out to all our connoisseurs today is the Champagne called Expression. And this is really the flagship of the house. We now have a totally different cepage, a totally different composition of grapes and a totally different region um, with sourcing fruit from the Valley de la Marne. We have a third, a third, a third approximately. So a third Pinot Noir, a third Pinot Meunier and a third Chardonnay, just slightly heavier on the Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier spectrums. And you can see if you are drinking the wine side by side that you've got a depth of colour. You know, so when I'm assessing a champagne, I'm, I'm eyes first, nose and palates. I'm looking at the colour. The depth of colour can tell me two things. It can tell me whether there's a predominance of the red fruit grapes. We're obviously breaking that skin, taking out the white flesh, but there is a little bit of colour exchange as you're running the, the juice through the skin. And also the nose. I mean, the nose on this wine is completely different. We've got more broad characteristics. We've got more depth. We've got more orchard fruit. We've got pear. We've got um, apple, we've got quince, we've got some almond characteristics. So I know already that there's more depth within the wine. Slightly longer aging horizon. So Jean-Baptiste is minimum of three years of aging, up to eight years for some of the more rare cuvées that are produced from the family. So we've got a bit more time. We've got a number of different vessels, uh, but everything aged in barrique. And what's really interesting is that he holds back uh, malolactic fermentation. So we're not going through that process of transferring that tart malic acid, like in a Granny Smith apple, into that creamy acid. He's holding back and retaining that tart malic acid so that he's got longer aging potential and a purity of fruit. And you really see that zippiness in the wine. It's not austere, despite it um, retaining that malic acid. And again, very, very low levels of dosage. So we've only got three grams per litre on this wine and it's not too shy. I mean, everything that's done by Jean-Baptiste and the girls is considered. You know, we're not doing extra brute for extra brute sake. He's doing it because he picks the fruit at a very ripe level. He's got an amazing quality uh, of fruit. He's got an amazing quality of base wine, of Van Clair. So he can actually keep that dosage level low and let the wine really sing, let it really shine through. What would I be pairing it with? I don't know, it's really dry on the finish. I actually wouldn't mind having um, this champagne with some caviar or a little bit of toast, just the, the, the saltiness, the dryness. 
hate to say it, but even something is like an anchovy. It's a very strong flavor, um, but I don't mind contrasting and mixing it up a little bit. I'd be trying a little anchovy on toast. It's got power, it's got weight, it's got a beautiful dry finish, and it's got some sophistication. So why not get experimental with your pairing? So for this month, I have chosen two champagnes that really do talk about legacy, showcase legacy. The idea that when you were born into a champagne family, that there is an obligation that you will follow in your father or your mother's footsteps. And when the tough gets going, then the going gets tough. And we must continue no matter what the circumstances, whether it's war, whether it's uh, difficult viticulture, whether it's storm, whether it's climate, or whether it's a death in the family, as has recently happened with Eric D'Souza. And the children, you know, no time to grieve, which is so incredibly sad. They really do need to, to stand in dad's footsteps and in mum's footsteps and represent the family for the next generation. And I know that um, there's another generation of D'Souza family that are already in the vineyard, small, but in the vineyard. And this is about the children now creating something to hand down to the next generation. There are years and years and years of know-how. There are years and years and years of winemaking skill that must be passed from one generation to the next. You would sit under your father or under your mother or under the winemaker for six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years before you fully had a grasp and were fully in the position to be able to take over the craft of making champagne, which is a time-honored craft. We respect the D'Souza family. We respect the Geoffroy family. I'm sure you can see that the wines will only improve. You've got two exceptional cuvées coming out to you this month. I hope you enjoy them. And I look forward to seeing you either at the next event or on our next tasting video. Enjoy the wines and take care.